The following program is rated BBMALSA. It contains strong language, sexual situations, awesomeness, and nudity. It is intended only for mature audiences. Listener indiscretions are advised. Welcome to our Bliss Bringers podcast. The materials we cover encourage adults of all ages, nationalities, and sexualities to open up and embrace their wildest desires and blissful pleasures. You won't find medical advice here, just our personal experiences following the journey of sexual evolution and education in sizzling fun topics that were definitely not taught to us in school, but have wickedly blossomed into reality. We discuss adventures in ethical non-monogamy, kinks and fetishes, exotic places to visit, sexy events, workshops, and tips allow us to seduce you into embarking on new adventures where each day you ask yourself what's your pleasure welcome back everybody and thanks for letting us in your ears again we have a special guest tonight we have daniel yes hello he is one of those guys that some people claim did the impossible he infiltrated the world of the swinging lifestyle as a single male, believe it or not. And it even survived to write a book about it. <laughs> so what everybody wants to know, what's your secret? Honestly, I just kind of fell into it. It wasn't like I, I sought out the lifestyle. I was just trying to get better at sex, and I just happened to find out that there was this thing called the lifestyle. Not knowing any better, I was just pretty much myself. And it ended up working. I, you know, wasn't trying to pretend that uh, I was better than I was or that uh, I wasn't putting on a fake persona as a lot of people that I come across in the lifestyle try to do. And it, it tends to backfire, at least in, in my experience. When people ask me, you know, what the secret formula is, it's sort of be yourself, be nice, be non-judgmental. Don't be a dick. And patient. Yeah, that's a pretty important part. <laughs> if you so, have Daniel, a- what's the name of your book? book is called Swingland, Between the Sheets of the Secretive, Sometimes Messy, but Always Adventurous Swinging Lifestyle. It's out on hardback uh, as well as ebooks at you know all the regular places. Gosh, that's title. a long title. Yeah. My editor liked calling it Swingland, and then he wanted a subtitle that kind of had a m- little more of an explanation to it. Good idea. When did you discover there was a lifestyle? It was about 10 years ago, and I had just gotten out of a relationship that You know, she was very nice, but we just didn't mesh. I had never had casual sex. All the sex I had was always in relationships. And I decided, well, I'm not getting any younger, so let's try. You know, there's some people that are like really good at just sort of closing that deal. And I tend to be a little more laid back, a little more reserved. But uh, um, thank God for the Internet. (laughs) And I sort of stepped out that way, sort of fell into it. Uh, I got invited to a, a party. That's when I heard about this thing called the lifestyle. Was it from the girl that you were dating? Because it's not like, you know, for swingers, we don't just go, hey, vanilla guy, come to the party with us. Right. No. Um, No, I was done with the relationship and I had gone on Craigslist uh, because I didn't know know what to do. And I just was responding to some posts. And one of my responses sort of found its way through the bowels of the Internet. And it was actually a legitimate posting. They were looking for single guys for a party. And so I responded. And then we, you know, there was the voice verification. And in the book, it's the chapter called The Deep End. What I did to actually get to the party, I don't recommend people do. I sort of said a a little (laughs) bit that I was a little more experienced than I was. Showed up and uh, was really blindfolded by the experience. Yeah, I I did. I I really jumped into the deep end. And there was somebody at that party that mentioned this term lifestyle. And I went, oh, what what is that? And he explained it. And I just thought, ooh, I want to go to that place. And he mentioned a website, (laughs) checked out the website and created a profile and then did a couple other websites and would email nonstop because as a single guy, you, you really don't have many options. And you just kind of bombard anybody who you think you might have a chance with. You're not being annoying, but you're reaching out to them. It took probably about six weeks until I started actually getting legitimate responses. And it was a few months after that when I got my actual first experience through the website. And then it just sort of snowballed from there because as you guys can probably attest, the social circles are very tight in their lifestyle. And so Mm -hmm. that reputation can spread very quickly, good or bad. And luckily for me, I tend to be the nice guy. And so that reputation sort of spread and, and I started to get certifications and that led to more experiences. Yep. 
<laughs> yeah, it's true. You got more endorsements. So yeah. the people that were reaching out to you that were responding, were they the single women or were they couples? Well, to start with, it was couples. Because, I mean, as you guys know, single women, there's a reason why they're called unicorns. They're, you know, it's very rare that you come across a very legitimate single female in the lifestyle. So it was couples and the couples became a couple groups and then that uh, became a couple regular parties. And from that point, I started to meet some single women who would come to the parties and it just sort of spread from there. But at first, it was definitely the couples. Well, that's really good uh, information because we have quite a few single men that we are meeting, just you know, new ones that are coming into the lifestyle parties. And so they ask us quite a bit of questions. And your book is a perfect timing because one of our very good friends from the vanilla world has crossed over to this dark side with us and <laughs> he is just full of questions and we don't know how to answer him because John was never single so he doesn't really know how to break into the lifestyle we came in to gather as a couple so your book is perfect timing actually I have a question for you then you said that this single male friend of yours was he a friend of yours in the vanilla world yes how, how was that transition I mean did you suggest that did he try it out or did he learn about what you guys were doing and then want to be part of it? Funny that you asked. Our worlds collided. Just having a Facebook chat, we were going to Burning Man. He was going to Burning Man, his direction. We were going to our direction. And in that conversation, he had mentioned that he's going as a single guy, that he and his girlfriend were kind of on the rocks and he needed a, a life transformation. I'm like, oh, that's great. Burning Man's perfect for you. But when he came away from there is he wanted to explore more of a sexuality. And apparently he had dabbled in the lifestyle. He tried to by setting up a profile, but didn't get any responses. Yeah. And so his, the perception was, is unless I have a woman, there's no way I'm going to break into this world. And, you know, John and I know some great single men. They are like part of the family for most of these couples. They're around all the time and we don't think anything about them being just single. So I, I know there's a way of breaking in. He just needed the secrets of how to break in. Yeah, it's, it's a lot of work to get the foot in the door for the first time. But if you do get your foot in the door and then you play it right and you're honest and forthright, and, and uh, respectful, then the door can really swing open. I've also heard single guys that they get their foot in the door and then it's just terrible because they just don't know how to behave themselves. I, I also think that if you have a lot of rejection to start out, it's actually a good thing because then you really, I don't know if this is the right word, but you, you really sort of savor when you do get the opportunity <laughs> and you're not going to blow it. Is there recommendations of manners that you found work better for you versus what you may have tried and it didn't work? One of the main things is there's a difference between perseverance and persistence. I think it was Einstein who had said the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different response or a different reaction. A lot of single guys that I've heard that, that are frustrated, they'll say, you know, I keep trying, I keep trying, and I want to say, well, how are you trying? And if you are being very blunt, you want to look at how you're approaching somebody. If you're doing it the same way and you're being a nudge, if you're annoying them or bothering them, that is something that's going to backfire. You need to persevere, whereas you try, but you can try it in different ways. You know, if there's a couple that you're really into, you want to stay in touch with them, but you don't do it on a daily basis. You yeah. do it every several days or maybe once a week. And it's it's not a, hey, when are we going to get together? It's, hey, how's your life going? You guys probably had a very hectic day. And if, if I was just emailing you, pressuring you to meet, that would just add on to your hectic day and the pressure and that would backfire. So being patient, persevere, and then also be yourself. Can you guys talk about people that when you meet them, you just know that there's a fake persona that they're bringing forward? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, how, yeah. How do you react to that? I need to go to the ladies room. <laughs> I, usually, I usually excuse myself. That's our keyword. I got to go to the ladies room. Wait a minute. You just were there. <laughs> <laughs> and do you guys have codes and, and signals when you're meeting a couple or anything to tell each other if you're interested or not? Yes. We're still refining them. Don't you think so, John? Yeah. We're still refining our, our code words. We just had this discussion just maybe two days ago. I've always been a single guy in this, and I was always believing that couples had signs or, or code words or something. And it's smart, but a lot of times I'll excuse myself in the middle of a meet and greet just so they can actually talk to each other. I'd rather them have an honest discussion without me there than some misunderstanding between the two of them because it'll be bad for everybody. 
Actually, I think that's a great idea. That's a yeah. good idea. That's very good. Leave the couple to talk to themselves. That works whether you're a single or a couple. Mm-hmm. When you come back, then you can say, ah, oh, you haven't run away. There's your chance. So that's exactly what I do. Actually, when I come back, I say, well, you didn't leave. I guess you're stuck with me now. Have yeah. you ever had anyone leave? <laughs> no, I haven't had anybody bolt. But if I sort of joke that way coming back, it, I find that it kind of it's sort of a, a nice bridge into that discussion without being pushy and saying, hey, what do you guys think? It sort of opens that door into that conversation of so what did you guys think? Where Where's your head at? And it does it in a sort of a playful manner so people don't feel too awkward just coming out and talking about it. Right. There's a whole bunch of tips that you can glean from reading the book, and some are less actionable but more directional, if you would call it like that. It gives, it gives some like good tips. Well, one very practical tip is be very careful when you're standing on top of a bed because there might be a fan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that, well, that was that first party that I went to. Yeah, I just, I, I guess be, I need to be more aware of my surroundings. I totally clipped my head on the ceiling fan. Um, oh my God. <laughs> yeah, it definitely sort of put a halt to things for a little bit. So I felt bad about that. But luckily, uh, I survived in that couple in the book. Uh, Theo and Ariana is the name, the names that I gave them. I haven't talked to them in a while, but we kept in touch. I went to a couple parties of theirs afterward and I did not injure myself, which is always nice. <laughs> yep. Oh my God. Welcome <laughs> new guy. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Another tip that I wanted to say is don't send cock shot unless asked explicitly. Yes. We uh, okay. So happen. Daniel, I have to ask, are you one of those guys that you send a penis shot? Like, oh, hey, this Cindy looks cute and her husband looks cute. I'm going to send a cock shot. Hello, I'm Daniel. <laughs> uh, no, I don't. <laughs> I've never done that. Would you recommend it for the men to do that? Well, here's the thing. If I want a lot of the men to not be uh, competition for me, then yes, please do that, guys. <laughs> But if I'm actually trying to be sincere and help, I would say don't do that. I would say that you should have some more revealing pictures that you can send upon request, but don't offer them up uh, yes, without somebody requesting it. Because I think like a lot of the single guys, like they just think, okay, this is a community where sex, it, all they see is the sex, whereas it's not sex. It's, the, in my opinion, it's a community of adults who like to have fun with other good people. And so there's that human aspect and you have to treat everybody as a fellow human being before you can treat them as a sexual partner. Agreed. And it's just a big turn off. Uh, remember that guy on OkCupid, okay baby? <laughs> so <laughs> so here's here's a single male story, right? The missus was hunting on OkCupid. Okay you were flirting with a guy and he didn't really have any pictures. So she sent him a message saying, oh, uh, email me some pictures. Just like that. Yeah. And then she calls me and like and says, oh, so and so sent some pictures, but I can't see them right now because I'm out. Can you have a look at the pictures? I think you were on the road or something. I was in the office, so I plugged my laptop in on my big screen. I'm like, oh, yeah, he sent some JPEGs. I open up the first one. Penis. <laughs> <laughs> on, on, on my big high def screen. Pen- um, OK, no. And and the next picture was of him and his son. No, no, that Whoa. is just creepy. Even they're unrelated, but still in the same email. No, don't send pictures of your kids. <laughs> don't send pictures of your junk unless somebody specifically asks. Yeah, you know what? And I, I think that that's actually good advice just in the real world. Mm-hmm. Don't send a picture of your penis unless somebody asks. <laughs> we, when we first entered the lifestyle, that was very common to get just a bunch of emails as soon as the new profile went up on this. I'm sure everybody has fallen into the site called, starts with the letter A. It was just a bunch of sharks that were sending hello and then a picture was attached with their cock and some of the guys were, were just hideously hairy and ugly and it was just scary. And I'm thinking, oh my God, is this what the swinger lifestyle is all about? John, we have to find another place to hunt because this is not doing it. <laughs> and uh, yeah, l- don't, don't. Uh, Let me ask this. As annoying as the, the cock pictures are, how annoying is it just to get that one word email? I don't understand that kind of stuff. I keep thinking it's spammers. Yeah. Are you trying to think this account is live? Yeah. Or or there's yeah. there's the very elaborate emails where you look at like mm, this is suspiciously well written. So what I do in those cases is I put 
uh, a couple of sentences of that in Google. And, <laughs> and if I see like, uh, oh, see there's multiple what? hits on this. Oh, this yeah. has been used before. So yeah, that's funny. Shit like that comes around, goes around. Yeah. And when you're saying like the elaborate emails, I mean, even like the one word emails are very annoying. But also if you get somebody's biography, that's just as annoying because you don't want to sit there and have to read for 45 minutes to, to get to know somebody. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Some of the men turn on this, woe is me, I'm newly divorced, trying to get into the dating scene. My friend suggested I try this website, would like to meet some really nice couples. I'm thinking, oh my God, drama, delete. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. From me, the best tip I think for a single male would be to try to make yourself useful in a group and make yourself invaluable and the rest will happen by itself. Even if that means that you're doing door duty for three different parties and nothing but that, you still make yourself part of the group and people see that you're reliable and then you'll get invited in. And once you're part of the social network, then things happen automatically. Yeah, I was going to say, and you just actually used the term, I was going to say that it's a lot like networking in business. Whereas if you want to run a company, you don't come into the business world and say, okay, I'm going to be your CEO. You start to get to know people and then the circles start to broaden and then eventually you find your place and then you can work your way in. I agree with that. I think that's a, a good strategy. Did you find that it took some time to build the credibility within the swinger community? Was it easier for you to go to the parties versus dating or sending emails? How did you meet people? You know, I actually say this in the in the book that I never was a big party guy. I've been to a couple, but they were really at the request of a, a single female who wanted to go and wanted somebody to accompany her. So I, I did that. But I have never been on a swingers cruise. I've been invited on hmm. some. I haven't done like the big Vegas parties or anything. I've done mostly house parties, one on ones or meeting couples. And I'm very forthright about that in the book. So why is that? I think it's just my personality. I tend to be better with smaller groups especially when it's I'm just not walking in blind where I have somebody who knows me and I sort of have that in it, it kind of eases with my personality I kind of like that it sort of softens the landing in there as well and I mean, as you guys can probably can you know you guys can probably attest when you go to the really big parties you'll probably know a few people but the vast majority won't and so you're really on a crapshoot but if you're at someone's house party then the people that are there in a sense have been vetted because they were invited so at least the host knows everybody There's a right. certain higher caliber of people. Yeah. There's something that is connecting everybody, and even if it's just the host, and that's sort of helpful. It, it, it weeds out some of the people that if you're going to a really big party that you might have to deal with. Right. I prefer smaller ones as well. It gets very overwhelming when you have lots and lots of people. We go to quite a few different types of parties, yeah. large ones. We do the Vegas ones. We've done cruises. There's some great ones like Naughty New Orleans. That's a very fun one. But yeah, I, I'm the same way as you, Daniel. I like the uh, I like the smaller ones. Do you know Mike and Holly on Playboy Radio? I've heard they, about they, they the show Swing. Yeah, they were just in Naughty in New Orleans. They said it was fabulous. Everybody who oh, I've talked is. to that has gone has said nothing but nice things about it. Yeah, the folks that put it on every year, they do a great job. French Connections. Bob and Tess are the coordinators, and they put 100% into it, and everybody walks away very happy. We were there in 2009 and 2010. We went two years in a row. It was that good. There's yep. a test. Yeah, that good. We would have gone again, except that they moved it into August. It was too hot in August. Yep. Oh, that is. Yeah, it's hot the third year. down there in August, isn't it? Oh, my gosh. July was painful enough. When they said they were moving into August, we're like, oh, hell no. This <laughs> California girl cannot handle that stuff. <laughs> so tell us about your kinky encounters. Yeah. One of my favorite experiences was a poker game I was invited to by a couple. And it was uh, tournament style. There were eight or ten guys, and we were all playing uh, Texas No Limit. And the wife was – it was a winner-take-all. Whoever won would get to have fun with the wife. And during <laughs> during the game, she was there, and she was naked the whole time. And whoever won a hand, she would sit on their lap or whatever you wanted, except for, you know, there was no no sex. But you could do what you wanted. 
until somebody else won the next hand and she would, you know, switch to them. That was fun for a couple reasons. One, she was one of the most gorgeous women I've come across in life, much less in the lifestyle. That was a pleasant wow. surprise. And she and her, they're actually married now. She and her husband are 24 seven in the, in the BDSM. So it, it was fun to watch them interact as well. They were all different levels of experience with the guys that were there. So you, there was this one guy who, when he walked in, I went, Oh, he's just, he should not be here. He is just weighing over his head. The very f- first hand that was dealt, he reaches for his cards and knocks his beer all over the table. He's that nervous. <laughs> and then, so, you know, we clean it up and then we play the hand. He actually wins the hand. So she goes over to sit on his lap. He's there stacking his chips. I'm like, Dude, you've got her right beside you. Get your priorities straight here. You know, don't stack your chips. Welcome the wife <laughs> into your lap. And he was probably like 22 years old. He he just he had no idea what he was in for. It went all the way up to some guy who was probably 65 years old. A little more experience. Exactly. I came in third, so I didn't win, which I was not happy about. But <laughs> bummer. But we took a break during the game, and the husband he had said, "Hey." You seem pretty cool. Why don't you just hang around afterward? So when the guy who won was finished and he was having difficulty with the playtime, as I was told, the husband ushered that guy out. And it was myself, one other guy and the husband with uh, the wife for a, a couple hours after that. And it was the most fun. And I'm still friends with them. So, Game on. <laughs> yeah, it was it was a lot of fun. You know, I've played with them since and they're into the BDSM scene. So I've helped out in some scenarios with, you know, some flogging and, and stuff. But I cannot say that I'm highly experienced in that. So was he the dominant and she was the submissive in the relationship, I suspect? Yes, absolutely. And it sounds like a fun party game. I think we need to do that here. <laughs> I know. I I agree. It was super fun. From when I've talked to them since, it was a lot of work. I mean, you, you got to imagine how many guys are responding to that post. It wasn't like they knew all the guys. It was they were finding some random people because I hadn't met them before that night. But it was a lot of fun, especially walking in and seeing the wife setting up the poker table with only a choker on was a wonderful image to be welcomed with. Woohoo! Hey, John, I have a new idea for Girls in Court. <laughs> you would be the prize. <laughs> so us girls will be playing poker, and you will be the prize. Um, I'm not 100% sure about that one, but there are not, no guys allowed in Girls in Court. <laughs> Come on, be the trooper. You can do it. Of course. I'll wear a ribbon. Nice. Or we'll just bring Daniel up, and Daniel, you can be the prize. I'm very open to all scenarios. <laughs> there you go. Daniel, when you do your hunting, do you have a specific type of lady or a couple that you're looking for? Is there qualities or attributes that you're looking for? Yes. I mean, you know, it's it's always evolving, but it's gotten to a point where I'm not really big on the whole newbie experience. I'm very open to giving advice, but I don't necessarily want to be there physically to guide a new couple through the experience just because there's a lot of emotions that they are <laughs> going to go through in that experience. And it, you tend to have to be very sensitive. Let and somebody you know, else deal with the drama. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. With a couple, I definitely want them to have have a strong marriage. I don't want to be an attempt for them to salvage a troubled relationship because I'm only going to speed up its demise. I'm not going to solve anything. And mm-hmm. I've been in a situation where I thought I was in, uh, I was meeting a couple that were very stable and it turns out they were speeding up the downfall of their relationship. And then I walked in and that was not a fun one. So I do like couples with some experience. I do like them to have a stable, loving relationship. A lot of it has to do with gut because you know, you're know you not going to know everything about every anybody you meet. And so if there's a couple that I email with twice and they're like, okay, come over right now. Let's get to know each other a little more so I know I'm not walking into a really testy situation. With single women, if, if I find out that they've just gotten out of a relationship, that's a dicey as well. I can understand why if they've just gotten out of a relationship that they're wanting to explore this, whatever they were curious about in sexual scenarios. But sort of like the the newbie couple, you're getting more baggage, or at least in my opinion, you're getting more baggage than you really want in a lifestyle situation. 
So for me, that's what it is. And also anybody who's, who can't laugh, you got to have a sense of humor. You don't have to be the funniest person in the world, but you got to be able to know a joke when a joke is told and be able to appreciate it. Oh, God, I got to get out of the lifestyle. I never catch a <laughs> there joke. You, I there am you the worst. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, you guys seem so serious. Come on. <laughs> I am serious. I'm a literal person. I take everything literally. But no, I agree. You have to have a sense of humor because there's going to be some funny situations that occur, especially if there's a threesome going on. There's there's a lot of little quirky things that go on. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's hard to there's stay serious. There's complexities. more when, people. <laughs> it's hard to stay serious when somebody gets a penis in the eye. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I think I saw a T-shirt with that saying on it. So there you go. Gosh. Daniel, what are your next projects? With Swingland, uh, I'm adapting it to a television pilot, so working with my agent on that. I'd love to see it on Netflix or, or HBO or Showtime, you know, not a network deal, because I don't think no. it, it could actually, I don't think it would get through standards and practices. <laughs> uh, well, you know, that series that was on Swingville, that it was a great little series, and then boop. Gone. Yeah. Did you think so? I didn't. I didn't like it. I only. I mean, I only saw one I or two episodes. It. Yeah. I, well, maybe it's because I was hungry for it. And there wasn't anything out there. I mean, we've got plenty on polygamous, but nothing on swingers. Yeah, that's. So maybe so, I was just hungry. I'm, I'm trying to get in there when the getting's good. Good. So there's that. How long did it take you to write your book? Well, you How know, long did it take to write Swing Man. When at first, when I was writing, I was like, I'm going to do a novel because, you know, I wasn't going to put my name out there that I did this. And regardless of the fact that I have a book, I'm actually a very private individual. But uh, I was having difficulty writing it in a fictional sense. And I would find that as I was writing, all of a sudden I realized I was writing I and me. It was going into that first person direction. So I thought, well, let's not fight this and let's just see what happens. And so once I decided to do that, it went really quickly. I think I wrote it the whole thing in about six months. No, I didn't have an agent or anything. I Googled, how do you get a literary agent? In the publishing world, it's very simple. There's a thing called a query letter, and it's a very formulaic letter, and you write it, and then you'll send it to agents or, or agencies that represent people that you write similar to. And I got an agent that way, and then he loved the book, and um, we worked on it a little, and then he sold it really quickly. So to write it, it took about six months once I decided – how to do it, although it did take about, you know, eight, nine years of research <laughs> in the mm -hmm. trenches. Well, is that what exactly. you're calling it? Yeah, yeah in know? the trenches. He's rolling up his sleeves and getting in there. No, no, I can't fuck anyone else. No, okay. In the name of art, I will. <laughs> Yay. Well, good. That's really good information to know. And where can people find out more about you and your projects? So my website is theotherdanielstern.com. You can also find me on Facebook at The Other Daniel Stern. Twitter, I am Other Dan Stern. And the reason that all these have other in it is there is a decently known actor, but who has the name Daniel Stern as well, who was in Home Alone and Bushwhacked, and the, he was the voice of the Wonder Years. Oh, all right. So, You're the other Daniel Stern. Exactly. Dot com. I have to ask one last question. Are you still single? Should we connect you with some of our single women? Uh, I would love that. Yeah. No, I, I am still single. As long as the women can play poker, I'm all good. <laughs> we'll we'll see what we can pull off there. All right. Okay, girls, you heard it. <laughs> Daniel, thank you so much for hanging out with us. Thank you guys yeah, for having me. It was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. See, we I think we just scoped out our next date, honey. All righty. <laughs> It, this has been the, the most thorough interview process I've ever been on for uh, to meet a couple, I tell you. <laughs> hey, you know, we gotta we can't be too careful or anything. Come on. Well, if, we were, if we were doing that, we would have done a video chat. <laughs> exactly. And I want a penis shot. <laughs> This is Emily from Cassidy, and you can find me and hundreds of other sexually social swingers at Cassidy.Blissbringers.com. And that's spelled K-A-S-I-D-I-E. Shout out. Today's shout-out goes out to a classic called Polyamory Weekly. This is Polyamory Weekly, tales from the front of responsible non-monogamy.
from a pansexual, kink-friendly point of view. This is Polyamor Weekly. I am your host, Minx. Yes, that first guy sounded a little bit like a robot, but they provide some excellent information on navigating the pitfalls of polyamory. Besides, cutting Minx looks really hot. You can find them at polyweekly.com. That's it for this episode. Make sure to subscribe to us on iTunes at itunes.blissbringers.com. While you are there, make sure to leave a review. Yes, you leave a review. Yes, I can see you. You're the one with the headset. Okay? Leave a review. It would help us and would be much appreciated. What else is new? We got a VIP mailing list that you can get on for notifications and inside scoops and special deals. Go to blissbringers.com slash mailing. We got a sponsor. That's right. For the best gear for the bedroom and the dungeon, visit stockroom.blissbringers.com and show them some love. And I think that's it. Until next time, what's your pleasure? All names mentioned in this show are either fictional, taken from public record, or held by people who have given their explicit consent to be mentioned.